The year is 1972. A young man is standing for election as senator of his home state of Delaware. He's too young to be sworn in, but by the time the results of the election are made known, he'll be 30, and legally old enough to hold the position. In those few months, he will win, being the only Democrat to stand against the incumbent Republican lawyer J. Caleb Boggs for the seat. He will hold the position of senator for Delaware for the next 40 years. Then, he'll be vice president. And then, after one of the most turbulent periods in American history, he will be THE president of the United States. This man is Joseph Robinette Biden, the 47th president of the United States. To say that the start of Biden's political career was smooth sailing compared to his recent career would be a misnomer. Born in 1942, the earliest of the Biden years were filled with difficulties, with his father's business declining around the time he was born and his developing a stutter early in life. He'd achieved middling grades through school, being remarked on as an unexceptional student, and in early adulthood would go to Syracuse University College of Law to start a career as a lawyer, though he'd meet his first wife Nalia there, who he'd have three children with by 1972. He was admitted to the bar as a lawyer by 69, racking up later in life scandals all the way, with accusations of plagiarism following him through his first year of law school and several draft deferments kicking him out of the Vietnam War, at a time when most didn't get the chance to avoid it. Leaving Syracuse, we begin the actual tale of Biden's political career, because his career as a conventional lawyer was pretty uneventful, with his earliest political records indicating a distaste towards the segregationist views of conservatives within Delaware, including those of leading Democrats. This sentiment wasn't anything new in the inaction of leaders in the state in dealing with riots and protests following the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. had de facto handed the state to the Republicans on a governing level, even with incumbent President Nixon's popularity waning. If you're looking at, pub, at Watergate as a start, you're looking at the wrong place. The, the distrust of the, of the federal government had started many years before that. None of what Nixon was doing was new. And actually, Nixon's argument was, I was the one that, you know, I, it, it wasn't so much that I did anything different. I was the one that got caught, caught and paid for everybody else's sins. And he, to a certain extent, he's right. What had happened at that time, what had happened with Nixon, is that the nation was polarizing. There was certainly a generational schism that had happened at the end of the 1950s, but it had become greater during the 1960s. Um, there was a generation of, a younger generation that were questioning America's role in the world, what it should be doing, for example. With the change of governorship in the late 60s, Republicans held complete sway over Delaware, with J. Caleb Boggs in the senatorial position and Russell W. Peterson being the governor. So, Joe transitions to being a Democrat after mentoring under a lawyer leading in the Democratic Forum, a group dedicated to the party's reform on a state level. Well, in the 70s, so we have the changing of the Democratic Party from what would have been a now considered to be a liberal party of the 1950s, 1960s, um, that of Lyndon Johnson especially, um, to one of, by the end of the 1970s, is his sort of a centrist group um, at the end of uh, uh, Jimmy Carter's administration, and then which has it, it, which has really become part of the political centre. And that is in, in part because it's trying to attract those are left behind by the, um, the Republican Party that has shifted further to the right. Biden's win and entry isn't that surprising in a retrospective sense. Delaware is a small state after all, and Biden was able to make good on face-to-face -face meetings across the entire area, coming across to family groups as young, in touch, and energetic, with a charming family to boot. You know, Delaware is a state where, you know, if you're a senator, you effectively know a hell of a lot of voters. You know, there's only, it, it, it's one of the smallest states in the union. Even so, he clipped the election, gaining a majority by only half a percentage point, making him the sixth youngest senator in US history. Biden has a very personal base. Uh, uh, he's a Democrat in a traditionally democratic state. Uh, it's a very small state. Um, and he is now, um, I wouldn't say senator for life. That would be putting it far too uh, bluntly. But, you know, he's a very, going to be a very difficult man to beat. So he is safe in his home state. The election was held on the 7th of November, and the results came in a few days later. Naturally, there was celebration in the Biden camp, and with Joe's appointment set for January 3rd, he and his family had his 30th birthday and Christmas to spend together, before he'd be sworn in. 
Sadly, Biden's wife Nelia and their young daughter Naomi wouldn't live to see that Christmas, being killed when a semi-truck hit their car on the 18th of December. Joe and his two sons wouldn't even get a month to themselves to mourn their deaths. Uh, the tragedy uh, gives him a, uh, a sort of uh, emotional uh, linkage with the voters, uh, many of whom, you know, rush to support him emotionally. Uh, and indeed, you know, he said, uh, you know, people gathered around me. Uh, that's why I think he said at one point, you know, that's why I, I, I feel I owe Delaware so much. The newly minted senator, however, did still have a job to do, taking his position with the energy expected of the young upstart he genuinely was at the time. Biden would push for a number of, at the time, liberal policies, pushing health and elder care, government accountability and environmental issues. Controversially, though, Biden would have a black mark permanently put on his record, where he took a firm stance against the practice of busing, a policy which proposed to push the integration of different racial groups from previously segregated areas by taking children to school in areas with different demographics. Now, what the Supreme Court said in 1954 was, even if the separate facilities offered to the two races in schools are equal, the very act of separation implies inequality. The problem was that they did not set a timetable for desegregation. They said that segregated schools must desegregate with all deliberate speed. That it wasn't until 1969, Alexander versus Holmes, where the Supreme Court said, okay, we've had all deliberate speed. It hasn't happened. Now desegregation must take place in schools at once and the South found itself having to desegregate immediately, and it was Richard Nixon who oversaw that. They still left another problem. As in the South, you know, uh, you had literal segregation, legally enforced segregation. That didn't exist in the North. But what happened in the North, and indeed cities like Chicago, Los Angeles, etc., in different parts of the country, was because you had white flight from the inner cities, you effectively had black ghettos and white suburbs, okay? That is not an exaggeration, a simple dichotomy. So the next question was, how do you desegregate uh, the separation of the races that, there is, that is a result of socioeconomic factors rather than legally enforced separation? Biden came out against it on the grounds that such a measure should only be used to combat legally imposed cases of segregation, not to forcefully move around groups of children based on what the demographics of their area happen to be. In 74, he made these arguments and more against it, though it support other measures towards equality and integration that he found more agreeable. Joe Biden, Irish-American, you know, he, he was very sensitive to the feelings of Catholic ethnics who, to them, they they did not want their kids, even, even moving race aside, you know, they wanted their kids educated in schools near to where they live. African-Americans weren't very keen on busing either, you know, and it was seen as a court-enforced, federal-enforced uh, policy. And Biden, who had a very good record on civil rights, broke the line. And, you know, he, he made these statements to say, you know, I don't believe in government enforced busing. Uh, there's better ways of doing this. Uh, those statements came back to haunt him when Kamala Harris uh, brought them up in the uh, uh, 2020 debate. Past this, though, he'd be boisterous enough that by 1979 he was meeting with the Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gormyok to discuss concerns in the US government about the failure of Congress to ratify the latest nuclear arms treaty between President Jimmy Carter and the Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev. Gormyok, it should be said, is a character noteworthy and interesting enough that he practically deserves his own documentary, being infamously nicknamed Mr. Niet for his frequent anti-Western vetoes. Joe probably had plenty of fun being thrown into the fire for that meeting. All the same, the end of Gerald Ford's presidency and the few years of the Carter presidency were a stiff and easy breath of fresh air for many Democrats at the time, especially with the division sown into the party via policy and ideological disagreements. Carter manages to point out that, that all everything that is wrong that is going on in American um, politics and American society as being a responsibility of Congress and everybody in Washington. And he approaches it as being an outsider to all of that. 
He says, I've nothing to do with this. I'm going to come in. I'm going to have a complete and utter clean slate. We're going to have, you know, conduct our farm policy with morality. Uh, we're going to, um, you know, roll our sleeves up and get through the economic crisis that we're in. And um, he managed to build a coalition of African-Americans, uh, women voters who are particularly important as well, uh, Democrats and Southerners um, to become uh, president in 76. And he campaigns, he manages to win an extremely wide open nomination process in, in, in 1976. The emergence of the new Democrats of the era, like Biden, is arguably a significant turning point for the party, and it's no surprise that this generation of politicians would soon become the new familiar backbone of the party. 